meet you in the morning. I will meet you in the morning. I will meet you in the morning over there. I will meet you in the morning. I will meet you in the morning. I will meet you in the morning over there. Will you meet me in the morning? Will you meet me in the morning? Just inside the eastern gates over there. I will meet you in the morning. Just inside the eastern gate. Then be ready, faithful pilgrim, lest with you it be too late. I will meet you in the morning. I will meet you in the morning, just inside the eastern gate over there. Meet me there. I will meet you in the morning. I will meet you. If you hasten of to glory, linger near the eastern gate, for I'm coming in the morning, so you'll not have long to wait. I will meet you in the morning. I will meet you in the morning. Just inside the eastern gate over there. I will meet you in the morning. I will meet you in the morning. I will meet you in the morning over there. Will you meet me in the morning? Will you meet me in the morning just inside the eastern gate over there? Will you meet me in the morning? Will you meet me in the morning? Will you meet me in the morning over there? Tell me now. I will meet you in the morning. I will meet you in the morning. Just inside the eastern gate over there. I will meet you in the morning. I will meet you in the morning. I will meet you in the morning over there. Look at Moses as King Joshua, saying that he's going to the great beyond. And there are gates, there, there are 12 gates, three on the north and three on the south and three in the east and three in the west. And he wanted, because there'll be a great multitude there, and Moses wanted so that Joshua will find him in the right place. So he said, I'll be waiting at the eastern gate over there. Joshua, tell me, will you be faithful to the very end? And will you meet me in the morning over there? Here is Elijah telling Elisha that I'm going on. Already you know, because the prophets have said, the Lord is taking your master from your head today. And I'm going, but I'll be waiting for you there. Will you meet me on the eastern gate? And Paul, the apostle, I've run the race. I've finished my course. I'm going on now because there's a crown of righteousness waiting for me. Joshua, 
I'm looking at your face and I'm asking you, I know I'm getting there. Because I've done what I need to do, will you meet me over there? Will you meet me in the morning? Will you meet me in the morning just inside the eastern gate? you meet me in the morning? Will you meet me in the morning? Will you meet me in the morning over there? Tell me, sing. I will meet you in the morning. Everybody, I will meet you in the morning just inside the eastern gate over there I will meet you in the morning I will meet you in the morning I will meet you in the morning over there Deep alive today I'm teaching you about heaven it's Revelation chapter 4 and we're looking at the throne of God and we're going to see the redeemed of the Lord around the throne, about the throne, and before the throne. And we're going to see the one that sits on the throne. And I see the redeemed of the Lord. Because you see at the end of chapter 3, the church is raptured. And at the beginning of chapter 4, the church is in heaven already. And I see the, uh, I see the living creatures. And I see the redeemed of the Lord, the 24 elders. And I see them. And I picture myself being there. And as a leader in deeper life, I know that not everybody is born again. And I know that there are backsliders there. That's why I'm asking the question, that will you meet me in the morning? When I look, I'm going to be searching for you there, one by one. And I'm go That's why I'm asking you, will you meet me in the morning? Will you meet me in the morning? Just inside the eastern gate over there, will you meet me? Or did you come here to play church? You came here to pretend, or you are part of the tires. You are not part of the wheat, and you are part of the backsliders. You don't want to get to heaven. You are just plain religion. Church, will you meet me? Will you meet me over there? Just inside the eastern gate, will you meet me over there? Will you meet me in the morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight, and we thank you because of the interest you have given your children to be here to study your word. We ask you, O oh Lord, that the deep things that you reveal to us in your word will have a definite spiritual impact in every life in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that our study will be something that draws us closer to you, and our study will make us have understanding and knowledge concerning the things of the end of time, so that, Lord, your name will be glorified in our lives and you revive every one of us as individuals and families and the whole church to the fire of revival will come in every heart as we prepare for the coming of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Give me a good amen. amen. We're still in our study of Revelation. And we've studied Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3. Already, if you have been with us since we've been studying, you will find out that the book of Revelation is divided into three parts. Part 1 is in chapter 1. And that talks about the vision of the glorified Christ, risen, glorified, exalted, majestic Christ. And then chapters 2 and 3 is talking about the church and its seven churches. There are seven churches there, and that seven means completeness and perfection and fullness. And it's talking about all the church throughout the church age. And at the end of chapter 3 of Revelation, the study concerning the church is complete, is ended. And then you come to another section in chapter 4. Actually, between chapter 3 and chapter 4, you have the rapture of the church. The church is taken away. And we find that church represented by 24 elders in chapter 4 already. We also find them in chapter 5. And then from chapter 6 all through to the end of chapter 18, you have the great tribulation on the earth while the church is secured in the presence of our Heavenly Father and before the Lamb of God Jesus Christ 
in heaven. And in chapter 19, you have the marriage supper of the Lamb. In chapter 20, the devil, Satan, that wicked one is bound and is put in the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. And that's the time of Christ reigning on this earth for 1,000 years. Chapter 21, chapter 22, you have heaven. That is the new heavens and the new earth. When the eternal happiness and joy and the people of God is uh, realized. We now come back to our study today, which is in chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, please open your Bible as we read together. Revelation chapter 4, reading from verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, the door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was a it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set, established in heaven. And one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, a sight like an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats, I saw four and twenty elders sitting close in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings, and thunderings, and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne were four beasts, living creatures, full of eyes, before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those bees give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created that's what we're looking at today last week we studied Revelation chapter 4 verses 1 through to 4 and then we noted at that time that you'll find that the throne of God is very central in chapter 4 and in fact in the whole book of Revelation the throne of God is very central. You need to notice this, that as the throne of God is central in heaven, in this revelation, so is the praise and the worship of God central. The worship of God is the central activity in heaven. And this chapter introduces us to that worship and to that praise of God. Here, we see, number one, the place of worship. Number two, the potentate to worship. Number three, the people who worship. Number four, the place in worship. Number one, we we'll see the place of worship. As we look at this Revelation chapter four, which we have read already, and you look at it from verse six, it says, "Before the throne, there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four bees full of eyes before and behind." And then it goes on to describe also the appearance of the four and twenty elders there. What were they doing there uh, before the throne? In this place, at the throne of God, we're told in verse, in verse 11, they were praising the Lord and they were saying, Worthy art thou, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are, and were created. We we'll see the place of worship number two. We we'll see the potentate to be worshipped. When we say potentate, that means the one that is the ruler with all power, direct power, supernatural power, unquestionable power, irresistible power over the people, over the nations, over the earth. That's the potentate. And that refers to the almighty God. Is the one that is worshipped here. Because we're told of the one that he was the one that sat on the throne. And he is the one that they worship. Look at verse 2. And immediately 
I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, one, the one that is holy, 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 almighty God, one, that is the creator of the heavens and the earth, is sat on the throne, that's the one that they worship. Who are the people, number three, that did the worshiping? The people that fell down before the Lord and before the God of heaven and they worship. That's the angels of God, the living creatures, as well as the people of God represented by the four and twenty elders in verse 10. And for the four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and they worship him that liveth forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne of God. And then who are the people worshiping? We've seen the people worshiping. What's the praise? What's the worship? What were they saying to the Lord in verse 11? Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are, and were created. If you look at that, he's telling you something about our creation. We are created to praise and to worship God. We are created so that we'll give pleasure to the Lord. We are created so that we'll give praise to the Lord. We're told in Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43, the purpose of our creation. Looking at it in verse 7. It says, even everyone that is called by my name. For I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, yea, I have made him. In verse 21, it tells us very clearly, these people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. It tells us the reason why you are created and the reason why you are living on this earth is that you'll praise God, you'll worship God. The question I have for you is, how much time do you give to what you are created for? You are created to worship God. How much time are you giving to that worship of God? You are created to praise the Lord. How much of your time, how much of your energy, how much of your intelligence, how much of your very life are you giving to what you are created for? And it's a salvation in Christ Jesus that prepares us and makes us speech and ready to worship and to praise the Lord acceptably. When you are born again, when you are a child of God, all your sins are taken away and you are being cleansed and you are being purged and there's a new life in you, then you are ready to actually praise the Lord. In First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, so that we may do what? That ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Therefore, you understand when you are chosen, part of the chosen generation, part of the royal priesthood, part of the holy nation, part of the peculiar people, then are you suited, then are you fitted to really worship God and to serve the Lord, the raptured church, the redeemed and the raptured people of God. They fulfill the purpose of God because now they are now in heaven. By this time that we are studying, the great tribulation is taking place on the earth. And it is now that they can really fulfill without hindrance, without interruption, what they were actually created for. And in heaven, angels and saints will praise the Lord and will worship God. You've seen that already. Look at chapter 4 of Revelation. And you see that all in heaven... Angels, men, redeemed people, Gentiles who are redeemed, and Israelites who are redeemed, they're going to be praising God forever and ever. Revelation chapter 4 verse 10. And the four and twenty elders, they fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, That worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, for thy pleasure they are. And they were created. In chapter 5, I'm looking at verse 14. And the four beasts, that is, the living creatures, those are cherubims. Those are high level, high order of angels. It says, these living creatures, they said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders, that is, representing the church, ransom, redeemed church in heaven, and the raptured church in heaven, they fell down. And they worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And the praise and the worship never stops because it goes on in chapter 7, verse 11. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four bees. You see, angels joined them now together with the cherubims and together with the uh, 24 elders representing the church. They fell down before the throne on their faces. What were they doing? They worshipped God. In chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 16 there. 
it says on the four and twenty elders, whenever you see that, twenty-four elders, always remember, they represent the redeemed soul, the saved people who have been raptured and now they are in heaven. That's the whole church there, which sat before God on, on, on their seats. They fell upon their faces and they worshipped God in chapter uh, 14 verses 6 and 7 still talking about the worship of the almighty god and i saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and and people saying with a loud voice fear god and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. In chapter 15, reading there in verse 4, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. And then when you come to the time of the marriage supper of the Lamb, that is in chapter 19. The praise and the worship of God is still going on, uninterrupted, unhindered in heaven. It says on the four and twenty elders, and the four bees fell down, and they worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty sounding saints, hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Praise and worship then surround the throne of God, and they rise constantly, that is, praise and worship rise constantly before the almighty God who lives forever and ever. As we listen to those words expressing the praise of God, as the angels and the redeemed raptured says, worship him. The praise increases as we move on until it transcends time and fills the whole of eternity. Number one, you find the pre-tribulation saints, that is, the people that have been raptured, the church of the living God, the righteous, sanctified church of God, raptured to heaven before the great tribulation, pre-tribulation saints, they were praising God. Later, they were joined by the tribulation saints, that is, the people who were passing through the tribulation, and then they were standing for their faith, and they were martyred, and they were killed. When they eventually got to heaven, you'll see that in chapter 7, they joined those who have been raptured before the great tribulation, and they praised the name of the Lord again. And that's not enough, because the redeemed of Israel, the Jews, those who were sealed, eventually, they joined them too, and they were praising the Lord. Eventually, the whole universe joined in the worship and praise of the only God that is worthy to be worshipped. As we look at the study today in chapter 4, verses 5 all through to 11, we're going to divide that into three parts. Number one, the wonder of supernatural lightnings and thunderings from God's throne. You read about those thunders and uh, those lightnings and voices, what do they mean? The wonder, the wonder and the mystery of those, uh, of those thunders and lightnings. Number two, the worship and service of angelic creatures before God's throne. And then number three, the worthiness and supremacy of God on the throne. Let's come back to number one. I read to you from Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, and the first part of verse 6. Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. It says, out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices and there were seven lambs of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Stop there for a moment. It talks about the thunders. It talks about the lightnings. And it talks about the voices. These at once reminds you of what happened, the sublime scene that you find that occurred at Sinai when God came down in majesty and power and honor and strength and glory. And he revealed himself unto Moses and unto Israel. Before we look at that, I want you to see that thunderings and lightnings and voices and sounds, they come out of the throne. You see that over and over in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 11, reading from verse 19, 11, 19, it says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings, there they are again, lightnings and voices and thunderings, 
and an earthquake and a great and great hail. As you move on to chapter 16, verse 17. That's what we're still seeing because it says, And the seventh angel poured out his veil into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven and from the throne, saying, It is done. Then in verse 18, and it says, And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since the since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Have you seen then as you are thinking about the throne of God in heaven? That you see the things coming out from there. It's actually the, the symbol of the majesty of God, the power of God. And you see those lightnings and thunderings and voices proceeding out of the throne of God. They are a preview of the explosion of God's fury in judgment as the judge of the whole world prepares to pour out his wrath upon the unrepentant world. When you see those lightnings and thunderings coming from the throne of God in the book of Revelation, it reminds you of the power of God, the fury of God, the wrath of God, the indignation of God going to be poured out upon the world that is or be living at that time. In Exodus chapter 19, Exodus chapter 19, I told you already that the lightnings and the thunderings and the sounds and the voices coming out of the throne of God, they remind us of what happened at Mount Sinai when God Almighty, in his greatness and glory and majesty and holiness, when he appeared on Mount Sinai. Exodus chapter 19, reading there from verse 16. It tells us, it says, and it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceedingly loud so that all the people that was in the camp, they trembled. It says, and Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the neither part of the mount. And the mount of Sinai, the mount Sinai was all together on a, on a smoke. Because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly, exceedingly. So you will see it was a fearful sight that the children of Israel, they were so much afraid, and they couldn't get near because of those thunderings. Do you understand that that's the time just before the law was given? And the law was telling them that if they broke the law, if they offended him, if they didn't do what he wanted, here is a preview of what was thrown down then. Here is a preview of the fury and the judgment that will come upon them. If you remember that when the Philistines came against the children of Israel, and the children of Israel cried unto Samuel, they said, pray for us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. He cried because of the children of Israel, for the, because of the Philistines, it says, and God thundered from heaven and discomfited the Philistines. He judged them. And that's the reason why those thunderings and lightnings around the throne of God, coming from the throne of God, the picture for you and for me, the terrible, terrifying judgment of God that is going to be poured out at the time of the great tribulation. In fact, what was the effect of the thundering and the lightnings and the voices and the quaking at the time in Sinai upon the children of Israel? You've seen it already. They didn't want to come near. How about Moses himself? What was the effect of the thundering and the lightnings and the voices on Moses himself? Turn your Bible to Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, you're looking at verse 21. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. It affected Moses also. Even though Moses was even living right, was a child of God and was living in a perfect way, at least uh, to the best of his knowledge and to the best of the dispensation of that time. Even though God had said, I know him and I, I talked to him face to face, even then when he had those thunders and saw the lightnings and had the voice and the earthquake, then he said, I exceedingly fear and quake. That means then it's uh, the real judgment of God that is going to come as a result of uh, the people that have not obeyed the Lord. See the warning we're given from verse 25 of that Hebrews chapter 12. It says, see, that he refused not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not, who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. And that's the implication of the sound of the thunderings and the lightnings and the voices that they were hearing. 
in Sinai. And that's the implication of that sound too, of the terrifying sight that John saw in chapter 4. When he saw what was coming out of the throne of God. It says in verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaking, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receive in a kingdom which cannot be removed, which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. And so as you see those things happening in the book of Revelation, is uh, preparing the mind of the people that something is going to happen on the earth. And when God Almighty pours out his wrath upon the inhabitants of the earth, during the great tribulation, everyone will tremble. In fact, we are told in Revelation chapter 6, see what their reaction will be when the real thing actually comes upon the face of the earth. In Revelation chapter 6, looking at it from verse 15, when the reality of the thunders, the reality of the thunder, of the, of the, of the lightnings, and the reality of the voice and the earthquake, when it comes upon the earth at the time of the great tribulation, here is the effect in verse 15 of chapter 6, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, each themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, follow us. Hide us from the face of him that seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And that's what they'll be crying on that day. And then as we go back to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. We've looked at verse 5. Look at it now. You have a better understanding of what you are reading. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. It tells us that before the throne, you have the seven lamps of God. And then it says that the seven lamps is actually the seven spirits of God. You will remember that we have said it before when we looked at Revelation chapter 1. Can you look at that again? Revelation chapter 1 verse 4. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia Minor, grace unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits of God, the seven spirits which are before the throne, which are before the throne. And exactly the same thing we're reading here at the latter part of chapter 4, verse 5. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. I told you at that time, I need to tell you again, maybe you've forgotten, that the number seven represents completeness, fullness, perfection. There is only one Holy Spirit. The number seven is symbolic of his perfection. The seven burning lamps are emblematic. That is, they are, uh, they are symbolic of perfect light that reveals that there is no darkness and there is nothing that you can hide before him or around the throne. And the fierce burning, blazing touches of the Holy Spirit and to the arch to the thundering judgment proceeding from the throne. Now, as you think about it, you find that the whole of the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, will be pouring indignation and wrath upon the world when the Great Tribulation will be here. Number one, there will be the indignation of God the Father. Number two, there will be the wrath of the Lamb. Number three, there will be the fiery, burning fury of the Holy Ghost. All joining together. And then the Comforter, that's the Holy Ghost. The Comforter at that time will become the Consumer. Because they have not yielded their lives to so the conviction of the Spirit of God. And they have not yielded themselves to so the conversion and the transforming power of the Holy Ghost. And they have not yielded themselves to the comfort and to the soothing voice of the Spirit of God. That comforter to them will become a consumer at the time of the Great Tribulation. And uh, if you uh, look at Revelation chapter 4. And you look at verse 5, verse 6 now, it says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. It's uh, telling us of the beauty that you find uh, before the throne of God. In Exodus chapter 24, Exodus chapter 24, 
looking at verse 10, uh, you will see the pavement. It is the floor just before the throne of the Almighty God himself. That's the description you have there. Exodus chapter 24, verse 10. Exodus chapter 24, verse 10. It says, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved walk of sapphire stone. And as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. That's what Revelation chapter 4, verse 6 is talking about. The clearness of crystal. The clearness of, of the glass before the throne of the Almighty God. That represents the floor, the pavement on which the throne stood. And this is a sea of glass, clear, transparent, like pure, perfect crystal, appearing like a sea, stretching afar, giving a sight of indescribable beauty. It's the solid expanse of glass before the throne. That's point number one. We go to point number two now, the worship and the service of angelic creatures before God's throne. Here you need to pay attention now. Look at it in Revelation chapter 4. We're looking at verse 6, the second part of verse 6. It says, And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. As you look at this, and it says, Round about the throne, were four beasts. If you read that without any interpretation, you begin to ask yourself, eh, Does that mean there are animals in heaven? Because it says, Before the throne of God, there are beasts. Well, you need to understand that what translated beast in English, actually in Greek, is zoa. And it just means living ones. And it means the living beings or the living creatures. If I read further, you must take note of everything now. And the first beast was like a lion. Please take note of that. And the second beast was like a calf. Another word for calf is an ox. The plural is oxen. And then it says, and the third beast had the face of a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. You see here that what John saw, this was a mystery to him. He couldn't understand. These living creatures, the kind of faces they had, one like a lion, two like an ox, and three like a man, and a fourth like a flying eagle. And then it says in verse 8, and the four beasts, that is the living creatures, you'll see it later when I read other parts of the Bible to you, and the four beasts, the living creatures, had each of them six wings about him. And then it says, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts, living creatures, give glory and honor and thanks. St stop there for a moment. Beast, giving glory and honor and thanks. That means they are not animals. That already tells you these are living creatures because they are talking and because they're giving glory to the Almighty God and because they're saying honor and thanks unto him that such on the throne who live it forever and ever. Well, if you follow through on this, uh, inter on this interpretation, that is that they are living creatures, look at Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1. And then you'll understand what the Bible is saying when it says it saw those living creatures, the Zoa, or the bees as translated by uh, the people that's translated into English. In Ezekiel chapter 1, I'm reading to you from verse 4. Take note. And I looked and behold, and a wild, a wild wind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the mist thereof as the color of amber, out of the mist of the fire. Also, out of the mist thereof came the likeness of what? Tell me out loud. Four living creatures. How many did we see in Revelation chapter 4? Four. Four of them. And it says they are four living creatures. And it says this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And look at this. And everyone had four faces. And everyone had four wings. And it says, and their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's feet. You see that? Calf's foot. And uh, it says, they sparkle like the color of burnished brass. It tells us in verse 8, it says, and they had the hands of a man under their wings, on their four sides. And therefore, add their faces and their wings. It says in verse 9, their wings were joined one to another. They turned not 
when they went it says uh, they went everyone straight forward notice notice verse 10 very well notice verse 10 and mark where you see a man where you see an ox where you see a lion where you see an eagle and that compares with what you have seen in revelation chapter 4 it says in verse 10 and as for the likeness of their faces they fall at the face of a man and the face of a lion on the on the right side and therefore add the face of an ox on the left side and therefore add the face of an eagle so you, you understand that the same thing you read you've read about in revelation chapter 4 you are reading about in ezekiel chapter 1 and ezekiel chapter 1 verse 5 says and also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures turn your bible to revelation uh, to ezekiel chapter 10 in Ezekiel chapter 10, it's talking about the same thing now in verse chapter 10, verse 14. In verse 14, it says, And everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. A cherub is an angel. That's why I told you, when you say cherub, that's singular. Cherubims, that's the plural. That's why I told you that those uh, uh, four living creatures that we have encountered in Revelation chapter 4, those are cherubims. That's the plural. And it says over here in verse 14, and everyone had the four, four faces, and the first face was the face of a cherub. The second face was like the face of a man, and the third face like that of a lion, and then the fourth like that of an eagle. Verse 15, and the cherubims. You see that? The beast in Revelation, the living creatures, that's the interpretation. And then these living creatures, they are the highest order of angels called cherubims. And the cherubims were lifted up, and this is the living creature that I saw by the river Kiba. Then in verse 20, this is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Kiba. And I knew that they were cherubims. So then you can identify these uh, four living creatures. Please come back to Revelation chapter 4. As we look at Revelation chapter 4, and we see these that uh, they are called four bees, actually four living creatures. These are four cherubims. And uh, as you encounter them, these living creatures, they are very close to the presence and the throne of God. As described by Ezekiel in what we have read already. These glorious, unique, elevated creatures are higher than the ordinary angels. They are an exalted order of angels and they guard God's glory. They guard God's power and God's holiness in, in blazing brilliance. If you come to Revelation chapter 5, Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, you begin to hear more about these cherubims, these living creatures, and these high order of angelic creation. It tells us in Revelation chapter 5, reading from verse 6, And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, living creatures, cherubims, and in the midst of the elders, that's the 24 elders, the uh, representation of the church raptured now in heaven, stood a lamb, that's Jesus Christ, as it had been slain, having seven horns, the fullness of power, and seven eyes, the fullness of enlightenment and knowledge and intelligence, which are the seven spirits, the Holy Ghost, the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts, living creatures, cherubims, and uh, four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them halves and golden pearls full of odors, which are the prayer of the prayers of the saints. Look at chapter seven. Chapter seven. And uh, you discover something here in chapter seven, and you are discovering their intelligence, their knowledge, their insight, that they know more than ordinary human beings in chapter 7 looking at it in verse 11 and all the angels stood round about and he, and he bowed around the throne and about the four about the elders and the four bees and they fell down before the throne and on their faces and worshiped god saying amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our god forever and ever listen to this and one of the elders answered saying unto him, unto me what are these which are read in white robes and whence came they and i said sir thou knowest you see uh, there are things that human beings do not know that even john up there did not know 
but the elders representing the whole church there and the four living creatures how they have such great knowledge in revelation chapter 19 revelation chapter 19 reading to you there from verse 1 we're still following through on these living creatures already you have seen from ezekiel that these are living creatures and these are the high level high order of angels and these are cherubims actually revelation chapter 19 verse 1 and after these things i heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying hallelujah salvation and glory and honor and power unto the lord our god for true and righteous are his judgments for he has judged the great one which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand and again they said hallelujah and her smoke rose up forever and ever and the four and twenty elders and the four living creatures and the four cherubims and the four bees fell down and worshipped god that sat on the throne and said, Amen. Hallelujah. And you will see then that they are worshipping God. Now, as you have read in Revelation as well as in Ezekiel, you will see that these four living creatures, that they had wings. And with their wings, uh, what were they doing? You turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. These extraordinary angels, extraordinary uh, creatures, uh, you'll see what they were doing in the presence of God and around the throne of God. It is in Isaiah chapter 6, reading from verse 1. And in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. What are we reading about here in Revelation chapter 4? Every time, almost in every verse, you find the throne of God around the throne, before the throne, on the throne. And then you hear it says, I saw the Lord. He was sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple above its two seraphims. You see that? These are high order of angels too. You have cherubims, you have seraphims, and then you have the ordinary angels. And it says above its two, the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face. And with twain, he, he covered his feet. And with twain, he did fly. And one cried unto another, saying, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. What were the bees, the living creatures, those cherubim? What were they saying around the throne of God, before the throne of God? The same thing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And it says in verse 4, And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. You see then the glory of God that came down in such a mighty, majestic way. As you look at these uh, cherubims, and you look at these uh, uh, creatures that are extraordinary, these living creature cherubims are full of eyes before and behind, and as well as eyes within. Please turn back to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, I'm reading in verse 6. It says, and before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four bees, living creatures, cherubims. They were full of eyes before and behind. That means they can see behind. You cannot see behind you. And they can see in front and they can see by the side. They can see all around. In fact, it tells us about them in verse 8. In verse 8 it says, And the four bees, remember living creatures, cherubims, high order of angels, extraordinary angels. It says, They had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes. Again, it's talking about their eyes. That all within and around, they were full of eyes within. That signifies that they manifest watchfulness and vigilance. And nothing can escape their observation. Nothing can be concealed from them because they are full of eyes. The faces of these living creatures that appeared to a John. Uh, it says that the face like a lion appeared, and that of a calf appeared, and that of a man appeared, and that of an eagle appeared separately to him. Now, I want you to understand this. If you have four, let's say you have four boxes, for example, and each of those boxes, they have side one, two, three, four. If you put them side by side, that is, you put, you put them like a rectangle. As we look at A, B, C, D, you are going to see only one side of A, only one side of B, only one side of C, only one side of D. And so John did not see all the other three faces of each of the living creatures. All that he saw, when he looked on this side, he saw that one like a lion. 
When he looked at the other side, he saw the one like a calf. When he looked at the other, he saw another one like a man. He saw another, he saw another one like a flying eagle. Now, what is symbolic in this? And what is the symbol, the representation of that? When you're thinking of a lion, what do you think about? Power and strength. When you're thinking of an ox, a calf, what you're thinking of that? You're thinking of an animal that carries load, that is for service. When you think of the man, you are thinking of reasoning and intelligence. And when you think of an eagle, you are thinking of speed and rapidity. What's that telling us about those living creatures that John, the apostle that he saw, he saw that these living creatures, cherubims, they had power, they had strength, they were ready for service, and they had intelligence, and they were speedy, they were very rapid in carrying out the commands of the Almighty God. These exalted angelic beings, they carry out the activities appointed to them by God, and they carry it out with, number one, with energy. Number two, with power. Number three, with intelligence. Number four, with speed and rapidity. Because it says, and the four beasts, those living creatures, they had each of them, they had wings about them. And you've seen those seraphim seen in Isaiah chapter 6, in that vision, that they had six wings. And you see how they employed those wings that they had. With wing, he covered his face so that he will respect God, honor God, reverence God, so that he will not look at uh, the glory of God, the majesty of God, just anyhow, so that there will be no familiarity that brings contempt in the presence of the Almighty God. And then the second thing that he did with, with two, they covered their feet. That is emblematic of their modesty and their humility in the presence of the Almighty God. And then, with two, they did fly. That means they were in swift response to the Almighty God and to whatever the Lord will tell them. Now, as we're studying this, what is this teaching us? It's teaching us that we too, like children, children of God, even here on earth now, we should do the will of God as those extraordinary angels of God are doing the will of God. In Psalm 103, Psalm 103, here is what is telling us from verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, living creatures that excel in strength, seraphims and cherubims that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearken unto the voice of his word. And now verse 21, bless ye the Lord. All ye the host, is host, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. That is, as those angels in verse 20 are commanded to do the will of God, and they're doing the will of God. Even we, the children of God that are ministering to him here on earth, we must do his pleasure as well. Bless the Lord. All his works, in all places of his dominion, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. The Lord is expecting that we too will have some of the qualities that those angels that they possess. Can I just remind you, number one, they had respect, reverence for God. And we too, we ought to have that kind of reverence and respect for the Almighty God. Look at it, you've seen it once, see it again. In Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, those angels, they honor God, they reverence God, they are humble before the Lord, we must have the same attitude. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, wherefore we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. With reverence and godly fear. In the presence of God, there should be reverence. And God is everywhere. God is everywhere. You honor God, you reverence God everywhere, every time. Not only that, I told you that uh, those angels that uh, with the two wings, they were covering their feet. It was showing their modesty and their humility. And what are we commanded in the word of God? As concerning humility, in First Peter chapter five, First Peter chapter five, verse six, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God. Children of God, people of God, church, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God. When you appear in the presence of God, when you appear during the service, when you appear during the study, when you appear even in the house fellowship, and God is there, where two or three are gathered in my name. There am I in the midst of them. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And when you are ministering to you, like, like if you are preaching, like if you are singing, like if you are doing any service in the house of God, we expect the mighty hand of God should be on you, should rest on you. 
wouldn't you humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Not only that they had reverence, not only that they had modesty and humility, they had swift response. Those angels, well, they were two wings, they were flying so that they will be able to speedily carry out the commandments of the Lord. How about us too? What's to be our attitude as we carry out the watch of God? It tells us something. How are we to respond in Psalm 119, verse 60? Psalm 119, verse 60. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. Can you say that? When you said a word or you have acted in a way that your conscience tells you that's not right, you shouldn't have done that, you shouldn't have said that, that's an exaggeration, that's a lie. Why don't you correct that? Do you make haste in making that correction? When you have manifested a kind of temper, which is not of God, and the Spirit of God comes to you and he says, uh-uh, how could you think like that, act like that? How could you just blow up like that with that bad temper? Do you make haste and go on your knees and say, oh God, I'm sorry, I blew it, I didn't do right? Do you pray immediately? When the Lord reminds you, restitution to make, maybe your second wife, or maybe you're having two women at home, or maybe you have stolen money, or you've done something you shouldn't have done, and you need to restore, you need to make restitution, and the Spirit of God reminds you and he says, here is what you do. Do you do it immediately? Can you say, I make haste, I delay not to keep the commandments of the Lord? And there's somebody around you and the Lord is saying, talk to that person before you get down from the bus. Uh, talk to that individual. He needs to hear the gospel. You don't know when he's going to die. And the Spirit of God is uh, nudging you and convicting you. Open your mouth and say something. And talk about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say like those angels that with you they did fly and they will have sweet, swift and rapid response to the call of the Lord and to the call of duty. Do you do it immediately or do you sluggishly wait until the opportunity is gone? In Genesis chapter 22, Genesis chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt, test, he, tempt, he tested Abraham, he tried Abraham. And uh, said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, there I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. Offer him there for me a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. God has never told you anything as difficult as this. God has never told you anything as great as this kind of sacrifice and consecration. And when the Lord tells you what to consecrate to him, what to lay upon the altar, your life, your time, your talent, your skill, maybe he's calling you and he's telling you that your skill is needed in the service of the Lord and your ability is needed in the service of the Lord. Yes, that certificate, first class, whatever it is of God, the Lord needs it. And he says, lay it upon the altar and sacrifice it unto me. I need that thing right now. How long do you wait? But you see those angels, angels swiftly, they will carry out the commandment of the Lord. How about Abraham? Look at verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. Early in the morning, the following day, the Lord spoke to him just now. Early in the morning, he rose up and he saddled his ass and he took two of his young men with him. And Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. That's what we ought to do. And we have the example in the life of uh, Paul, the apostle in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. I'm reading to you from verse 15 and verse 16. Galatians 1, verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen immediately. No delay. Immediately. No retardation. Nothing dragging the feet. Immediately. I comfort not of flesh and blood. And you see what the Lord is telling us, what we're learning from these angels, that this is how those angels, this is how they obeyed the Lord. Come back to Revelation chapter 4, and then we're looking at verse 8, you see the employment or the service or the worship of these uh, supernatural beings, these cherubims, these living creatures, uh, the, the sower that uh, we find in Revelation chapter 4 verse 8. And the four beasts, living creatures, cherubims, add each of them six wings about him 
and they were full of eyes within. That's their intelligence. That's their vigilance. That's their watchfulness. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, then the four and twenty elders also responded, and he fell down before him that sat on the throne, and they worshipped him that liveth forever and ever, casting their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy art thou, O Lord. And you will see then that worship is their constant uh, occupation as they praise God's holiness. These living creatures, these angelic creatures, constantly give glory and honor and praise to God. They fill up the whole time and employ day and night in the worship of God who is eternal, existing in the past and existing now and will continue to exist forever. That's what it means when they said, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. And then he said, which was? You have always existed in the past. There was no time in the past, no day, no year in the past. Even before the beginning of this earth, there was no time when you did not exist. You were and is, and is continuing to exist today and is to come. Will continue to exist forever and ever. Let's come now to point number three. The worthiness and supremacy of God on the throne. We'll look at Revelation chapter 4, and then we'll look at verses 10 and 11. Revelation chapter 4 verse 10. And the four and twenty elders, please remember I've told you before that these four and twenty elders, they represent the church. Because the church is now in heaven. You see after, after chapter 3, when you get to chapter 4, the church is already in heaven. And the four and twenty elders, how do we know that they represent the church? Look at chapter 5. In chapter 5, reading from verse 8, and when he had taken the book, the four bees and the four and twenty elders, they fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us. That's why we say they are, church. they are the church. These twenty-four elders, they said, You have redeemed us to God, by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Those are the redeemed of the Lord. Those are the people that are born again. Those are the people that were living the victorious life overseen by the power of the blood of the Lamb. And it's out of every kindred and every tongue and every people and all nations. And it says in verse 10, And has made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. We shall reign on the earth. These are the overcomers. Because Jesus Christ promised, he said, if you overcome, you will sit with me on my throne, uh, just like I have overcome. I'm seated with my father on the throne. And he said, we shall reign, we shall reign. And he said, he will give them a rod, and then they will break the nations into pieces. That tells you then who these are. These are the redeemed of the Lord. Now, these people, look at it now. Go back to chapter 4, verse 10 and verse 11. The four and twenty elders representing the church, they fall down before him that sat on the throne. And they worship him that liveth forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne. Angels don't wear crowns, but it's the people of God we shall wear a crown. We shall wear a crown. We shall wear a golden crown. And here now, they had been given their crown. And Paul the Apostle said, as part of the church, I've fought a good fight, I've run the race, I've finished my course. Now, a crown of righteousness is waiting for me. These are the people of the church. They are raptured, they are, they are in heaven already, and they are wearing the crown, but when they come to worship the Lord, they cast their crowns before the throne. And they were saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created and so you will see then they were you were talking about the worthiness of god and the worthiness of the lamb and the supremacy of god and of the lamb in chapter 7 of revelation verse 11 and all the angels round stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four and the four bees and fell before the throne on their faces and they worshiped god what were they saying they were saying in verse 12 amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. And everybody said, 
Amen. In chapter 19, verse 4. Revelation chapter 19. Looking at verse 4. And the four and twenty elders. Remember once again, that's the church. Raptured. Now they're going to take part in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the four and twenty elders. And the four beasts, the living creatures, the cherubims, the extraordinary angels. They fell down and worshipped God at such on the throne. Saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And so you will find that they were worshipping God. The God of heaven and they were saying that he is worthy and of course god is worthy and then as we look at their praise uh, you will find that uh, their praise uh, tells us that is, they were praising and glorifying and exalting his worthiness i want you to look at uh, revelation chapter 15 verse 4 in revelation chapter 15 verse 4 here it says who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all the nations, all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. It tells us in First Chronicles chapter 29. In First Chronicles chapter 29, reading from verse 10. First Chronicles 29. Verse 10. All through to verse 13. It says, Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed art thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory the, the majest and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in the earth, they are thine, is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou, thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore our God will sing thee, pray and praise thy glorious name. And you will see all this is just the glory of God because when you know God who God is, whether you're on earth or you're in heaven, when you see the beauty of God, the majesty of God, the glory of God, that's what you will do. You will honor the Lord and glorify the Lord. You'll tell, you'll tell everyone that God is worthy of our praise. In Psalm 96, Psalm 96, I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 96, verse 1. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord. Bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory. Among the heathen is wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. For the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the, of the people. We uh, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his court. So worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. And so you will see what those angels were saying. Come back to Revelation chapter 4. In verses 10 and 11, the 4 and 20 elders the church in heaven, raptured, already there, they fall down before him that search on the throne, and they worship him that liveth forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, and for thou hast created all things. You see what they said? Thou hast created all things. Well, that is testimony of the whole of Scripture. In fact, Jeremiah tells us, in Jeremiah chapter 10, talking about the greatness of God and the power of God and the might of the Lord. In Jeremiah chapter 10, reading from verse 10, Jeremiah 10, 10, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble, and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. Thus shall you say unto them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under, the, under these heavens. He, the God of heaven, he, the one that we are worshipping and praising, he has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom and he has stretched out the heavens by his discretion. And uh, Almighty God himself testifies to Jeremiah and then Jeremiah tells us that he 
is the creation, is the creator of the heavens and the earth. In Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing, nothing, nothing to hide for you. And then in Revelation chapter 4, where we're studying today, it says, Thou art worthy. O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things. Listen to this now. It says, For, that, for thy pleasure they are and were created. For thy pleasure they were and they are and were created. That is, you are created for the pleasure of the Lord, not for yourself. You are everyone and everything on earth that you see, everything is created for the pleasure of the Lord. It tells us in Colossians chapter 1. Verse 16 and verse 17. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. By him all things consist. As this chapter closes, and this part of the revelation of the glory of God comes to its conclusion, John sees and hears these 24 elders, representatives of the redeemed raptured church, praising and worshipping God, the extol, the worthiness and the supremacy of God, who sits on the throne of universal power and authority. God, the creator of all things, is worthy of universal adoration. No one can meditate on the vast and wonderful universe without praising God and acknowledging him to be worthy, to receive glory and honor and power. Whatever wisdom, whatever power, whatever goodness, whatever beauty, whatever glory is manifested or observed on the earth or in the universe is to be traced to God. And it's the expression of what is in him from eternity. He is worthy of praise and honor. These 24 elders fall down in humility and reverence before God. And they cast their crowns before the throne. The overcomers then realize that they owe everything, their triumph to the grace of God, their strength and faithfulness to the God of heaven, who keeps and preserves even until the establishment of his kingdom. Therefore, that's the reason that they place their crowns at his feet and they worship him. What are we learning from all this? That these representatives of the church in heaven, that they worship God. Well, it's teaching us something very significant that we too, we ought to worship God and God only. How are we to worship God? In John chapter 4, John chapter 4, I'm reading to you from verse 23 and verse 24. But the hour cometh, and now is. This is the time. This time in your life. This period in your life. And for the rest of your life. This is the time when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Not carnal worship. Not fleshly worship. Not the kind of music you are dancing and, you know, men to women and women to men. Not that. That will worship in spirit, not with the flesh. And then it says, and in truth, not with error or false doctrine. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. When you come to worship the Lord, you forget about self. You forget about the flesh. You forget about every other mundane sin. And you worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And you worship God and God only. In Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, uh, the Lord told uh, Satan when Satan came to tempt him and Satan was uh, requesting, demanding the worship. But then here is the answer of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4 verse 10. And then, then said Jesus, get thee behind me, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. As you are preparing to get to heaven because the rapture will take place anytime. Already, you see the revelation we have from heaven that those 20 and 4 elders representing the church, all they do is worship God only. And Mary in heaven, no, they didn't worship Mary. Peter, they didn't worship Peter. Any saint, they didn't worship Saint Augustine or any other person. They worship God and God only. And while we're on earth here, that's what the Lord is expecting, that you'll worship God and worship God alone. He tells us in First Chronicles chapter 16. And then in verse 28, 
here is what it says give unto the lord ye kindreds of the people give unto the lord glory and strength give unto the lord the glory that is due unto his name bring an offering and come before him now worship the lord in the beauty of holiness would you be conscious then of rendering service unto the lord and let it be offered in holiness unto the lord and paul the apostle reminds all of us he says i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, that's the holiness and worship, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and in your thought, in your mind, in your action, in everything you do, in the house of God, and with yourself, with your body, anywhere, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. We've studied today the way the ransomed, redeemed, raptured church in heaven, the way they are worshipping God. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing for you here on earth to even join with them now? Now, you can only do it if you are born again. If your sins are washed away, if there is no error, no false doctrine, and you are ready to worship in spirit and in truth, then you join them. And as they lay their crowns down before the Lord, everything you have, you lay down before the Lord. And you say, Lord, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things and for your pleasure they are for your pleasure i am for your pleasure they were created and for your pleasure i am created let us rise up now and honor the lord and glorify the lord and worship the lord and just forget about yourself and forget about every other thing lay everything before the lord and say yes lord i come to worship you i come to worship you i join the saints of god on earth and those who are worshiping you in heaven and one day the worship will be complete as we will be raptured and taken away from this world and then we'll join the cherubims and the seraphims and the angels and the redeemed of the lord and the redeemed israel and everyone in heaven and then we'll say you are worthy O lord and then we'll give all the glory to the Lord. Worship the Lord while you are here. Worship the Lord for the rest of your life in spirit and in truth. And then when you get to heaven, you'll continue to worship all the saints of God in heaven.